Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we are looking at what happened to Suzanne's inheritance from her mother, $500,000, and some of the circumstances surrounding that. We've gone into the cancer narrative to some extent, but we still need to figure out the money trail. Now, one of the questions I needed to clarify in my own head was the status of both Barry and Suzanne's parents. Where are they? What has happened to them? And that is fairly easy to kind of sort out. Um, Barry has lost his father, I think in May 2006, and Suzanne, both her parents, her mother, um, I'm not quite sure when her mother died. I think it might have been prior to her move um, from Indiana. But her father died shortly after she disappeared, a couple of months after she disappeared. So she's lost both her parents. Barry's lost um, his father. And the reason I kind of was just wondering about it is if you compare the Watts case, you sort of see and hear about the parents quite a lot. Whereas in the Morphew case, the parents are almost entirely missing from the narrative and you sort of wonder um, to what extent something like that might play into the psychology and the events. You don't have a parent looking over your shoulder, they're sort of out of the way. There's also the thing of inheritance and, you know, living your best life. But we really want to look at specifically Suzanne's $500,000. What happened to it? Before we get to today's episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. Thank you to the hundred or so who've subscribed since the last video. And let's get started. So Suzanne Morphew um, and her family, they originally were living in uh, Alexandria, right? Uh, well, she's certainly originally from Alexandria, I guess Barry is as well. But they moved from there to Arcadia. I must say I was quite um, amazed that, that, that the place was called Arcadia just because when Simon Sharma describes these landscapes that are like gardens, you know, it's sort of semi-wild, but it's a kind of a tamed, extensive tamed uh, wilderness um, that, that is known as Arcadia. It's kind of um, a the, the transformation of the wilderness into um, landscaped lawns and gardens not not kind of like the boutique lawns you have in suburbia but something in between um, ro- almost like a golf course you have sort of rolling lawns and trees and and to some extent manicured um, verges and so on but um, certainly um, these extensive um, landscapes that, that are often associated with those British um, and French uh, estates, country estates, and that the word for that is Arcadia. So I was quite amazed that that they actually came from a town called Arcadia, and that's a small town about 35 miles north of Indianapolis. And they left Indiana- Indianapolis in 2018, and I presume they must have left somewhere around May, um, or were preparing to leave around about that time. Um, It may have been a couple of months after that um, in the fall, but the reason I say that is because she was starting to post photos of the Arcadia home onto Facebook in May. So that was when the decision to sell and to sort of leave and to uproot was essentially underway, right? So... It is also very interesting, this date, May 2018, a lot seems to happen in May. As I said earlier, Barry's father died in May. Um, They decide to leave in May. And, you know, she puts up these photos in May as well. And, of course, Suzanne disappeared and probably died in May as well. So they put the house on the market in May, Um, their house in... um, in Indiana and the house was 13 acres of land the listing price was $895,000 and that property never sold the Morpheus apparently still own it as far as I know I don't know if it's 
if it's um, if they've tried to you know if there's been some kind of news recently, but apparently you know they uh, just couldn't sell that house for almost nine hundred thousand dollars. But if you take the listing price for that house, almost nine hundred thousand dollars, and um, Suzanne's five hundred thousand, you add it up. You know, it's one thousand four hundred dollars. Well, guess how much they purchased their um, former home um, in April twenty eighteen for one thousand five hundred and seventy five dollars. Now I've heard that it sold for just over one point six million. Uh, I've heard different numbers there, but um, in two years, that's not much of an appreciation. Uh, the house was built. The house in Puma Path was built in 2008, and the property is seven acres of land, so it's quite large. But even so, it's half the size of the property in Arcadia, right? But you kind of have an interesting situation here. Um, you know, if they were listing the house and I'm not quite sure how they purchased that, that house, but one would imagine that they would use their other property possibly as security. I don't know. But if you take if you use that equation, then what about the remaining approximately six, seven hundred thousand dollars? Now it doesn't necessarily mean that they would want to pay cash for their house. Um it doesn't necessarily mean that that was the case, but it's just interesting looking at the math from that kind of perspective. Now, I have heard um, secondhand, I guess, that Andy Moorman basically said, so that Suzanne's brother, said that um, the $500,000 that she inherited from her mother, that went into the purchase of that house. In fact, I think the word that was used was that the 500,000 half a million dollars was quote unquote invested in the property on Puma Path. So I do think that that is really interesting because if you think about it in an indirect way, um, Barry has gotten that money now. So Suzanne inherits $500,000. This is if this, this um, equation is true and holds up. She inherits five hundred thousand dollars, and I've I've heard something about inheritance can't be inheritance money can't be sequestrated in a divorce. It's protected protected under law, right? Um, but in in this situation, if it was invested in the house and part of the purchase of the house or whatever, then Barry would have. Di- benefited directly from selling the house and Suzanne not being around. And I don't think it was um, legally ascertained that she was no longer alive, but he got guardianship, which means that he was able to sell the house and basically take custody of the um, the proceeds, right? But in an indirect way, Barry got that $500,000 and change probably. The other thing that I think is interesting is the house feels like Barry's house, but I think Suzanne must have agreed to buy it. Um, She must have also liked the inner vibe, but the the whole place feels like a hunting lodge. It doesn't really feel, you don't really get a sense of Suzanne in it very much. So there was also a, um, charity organization that Suzanne started, the Suzanne R. Morphew Hope Foundation, which she started in 2012 with the Indiana Secretary of State's office. And her husband was listed as a principal in that. And then she dissolved that nonprofit in Indiana when she when they relocated to Colorado. Um, and then this is quite interesting. It was registered with the Secretary of State's of Colorado's office in February 2020, so just um, two, three months before um, Suzanne disappeared. 
Something else that I think is relevant and interesting and noteworthy in terms of the Morphew finances, and I can't show you photos of this, I've just heard it. Um, Barry um, drives a, I think it's a Ford Lariat F250. It's the same vehicle Chris Watts, the same kind of vehicle Chris Watts drove. It's quite a big Ford. And then Suzanne herself drove a new Land Rover. And then Mallory, I think, drove her mother's old Land Rover. So just in terms of the vehicles they were driving, sounds pretty pretty classy um, wheels that they've got. Then I've seen quite a few people commenting on the previous video that that's about the cancer narrative, arguing that the role of the cancer is likely not financial, that it was probably covered by health insurance. And that might be true. It might be true that the role of the cancer wasn't financial. We're just trying to find out why was it necessary in the mind of the killer to commit murder? What was so why was it so important to commit murder rather than get a divorce and in the watch case we saw the importance was related to money and and living beyond his means and this big house that they couldn't afford right and also very much part of the um, dynamic with chris watts on the day of of that, that that the disposal occurred was getting rid of the house. It was uppermost in his mind. So one wonders how many similar kind of mechanisms were at play in this case. So the role of the cancer may not necessarily be financial. It may be um, kind of an emotional toll. Um, it may just have separated the couple in a way. Um, we do get a sense from that from from someone that was, I think, bedridden next to Suzanne, which I mentioned in the previous video. Something else that I think is just interesting that when they moved to Puma Path, initially apparently there was no landline, and so it was difficult for Andy, her brother, and and I guess other family members to get hold of her because there was initially no landline. Even though that house was built in two thousand eight, I don't know whether they didn't have some of those services all along or whether they dismantled them or whether the Morpheus took their time in setting them up. But the other thing was that spotty cell, cell phone connection. So um, that was also erratic, right? And that would also frustrate the ability of family members, especially from out of town, to, to get hold of, um, for example, Suzanne. And then the internet also didn't work so well. So it was kind of a um, an island where there was like noisy interference from the, I guess, the landscape, um, creating a kind of a barrier and for all intents and purposes, creating a or sort of insulating and isolating that sort of castle in a in a kind of a moat that that couldn't um, necessarily access um, you know what is going on um, efficiently I'm not saying that that if you wanted to send an SMS you couldn't because we know that she did I'm just saying it may have been, there may have been certain areas in the house where you couldn't get a signal um, I've got a friend in Houghton in Johannesburg where there are definitely dead zones in his house where if you're walking for example into the kitchen as you step into the kitchen uh, you lose cell phone signal. Um, but I think it was quite a lot worse there. It's also possible that you had these problems when they moved in and for the first couple of months. And bear in mind, she moves in and then the cancer sort of, um, you know, gets its claws into her. And at that critical time, she can't really communicate. And then she's in the hands of those around her, including Barry, right? Um, it's also possible that the communications infrastructure improved gradually over time, but to what extent um, is difficult to say. Then just a final point I want to make. Suzanne w was sort of 
wanting to go back to Indiana for two reasons. The one was that she was planning a wedding. And of course, because of the lockdown and, and the situation with the pandemic, there were some problems with that. Um, you know, you could only have a certain kind of capacity, but apparently she was sort of planning a wedding um, at uh, about the time that she disappeared. And prior to that, she was planning a 30-year school reunion. So she was kind of thinking about home. She was thinking about going back kind of thing, right? So I hope that you found that helpful. The 500000 that was Suzanne's was, quote-unquote, invested in the home. And the fact that Barry's since sold that home means that he basically got that money, doesn't it? So that's, that's it for me. I'm not going to take it further than that. This weekend, probably Saturday, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we're going to take on a complex, difficult subject, which is when did the premeditation start? So uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, also your questions on that, and your comments. So if you've got something to contribute in that area, please let me know in the comments, and um, I'll sort of add it to the roster of things that we're going to address in that particular live stream. Do any of you know exactly when Suzanne's mother passed away? Because I'd be interested to know that as well. In any event, thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>